Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Dr. Shweb Ahmed Malik. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Salam alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam. Was so, from Texas? From Texas. Oh, oh, you're Texas. Oh gosh, yeah. where else in Texas? Austin. I'm in Austin, Austin. right now. Wow, yeah. a big, big state, I hear. Gosh, massive, massive state. <laughs> probably Britain entirely into one American state, which is very usually... plausible. Very plausible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the question today is: Was Charles Darwin an atheist? Uh, Dr. Shue will tell us about the misconceptions surrounding Darwin's struggle with his own Christian faith and how in our time certain atheists have tried to exploit Darwin for their own purposes. Shue, for those who don't know, is an assistant professor um, in the College of Natural and Health Sciences at Zayed University in Dubai, where he's been teaching for seven years. In addition to his PhD in chemical engineering, Dr. Malik is currently completing his second PhD in theology um, at the University of St. Mary's in the UK. He is the author of Islam and Evolution, this amazing book, folks, Al Ghazali and the Modern Evolutionary Paradigm in the Routledge Science and Religion uh, series, which I highly recommend, published by Routledge in 2021 which was chosen as the best academic book of science and religion by the International Society for Science and Religion in 2022. He is currently writing a textbook and a micrograph on the pedagogy of Islam and evolution for Rutledge and has several other edited volumes and special issues underway. So who was, was Charles Darwin an atheist? Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, uh, for inviting me and also for allowing me to uh, share this presentation with you. Uh, so to give everyone some context as to why I did this presentation, mm. uh, it came, I mean, whenever you look into evolution, uh, a lot of misnomers are thrown around. Um, evolution is put in very caricature terms. But in addition to that, I think even the founder has been very badly maligned in many different circles and spaces. And this is just me providing a slight corrective on Charles Darwin's background and just explaining who he was as a human being. I'm not here defending his ideas. I'm not here defending evolution. I'm just here uh, to give you an overview of what kind of man Charles Darwin was. Very useful exercise. Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. Because when I, I mean, when I um, started learning about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, we were always told to be very careful, understand the seerah properly, carefully. You know, this is, this is somebody that people love, cherish, and adore. And one of the things that comes out of that is that you have to always be careful in making sure that you don't um, misrepresent someone. And we take such care with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when I looked into Charles Darwin, I wanted to see, was he really such a bad guy? Was he really out to get the world? Was he really trying to undermine religion? And when I started reading about him, a lot of my opinions changed because I was first a creationist. I was a um, creationist slash, you know, intelligent design advocate. And I realized that a lot of the material that I read about Charles Darwin was in fact incorrect. And mm -hmm. these were due to a variety of reasons uh, and motivations, but we'll, we'll come to see exactly what kind of person he was. And just yeah. to make it clear, this is not going to be an exhaustive overview. Naturally, this is you know a short presentation, but I, I have left books towards uh, the end of the presentation that people can pick up and read later on. And, and you're not doing a theology here. It's not a theological analysis. It's an historical biographical analysis of the man, I understand. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I know many people know me and recognize me as the Islam and evolution guy. So exactly what Paul said. I'm not talking about theology. I'm not talking about evolution's uh, evidence. I'm not talking about it's compatible with Islam or Christianity, nothing like that. Right. I'm just talking about having a historical overview of Charles Darwin. Yep. So Muslim perceptions of Charles Darwin range from atheism all the way to imperialism with all the stuff in between, right? Yep. And um, it's it's very sad that um, people subscribe all kinds of things to Charles Darwin because, I mean, we even know that as Muslims, if we, if we do misalign someone and we say something bad about them, we could be held accountable in the day of judgment for those things. And so that's why I took utmost care to really making sure that when I was going through Charles Darwin, I wasn't misunderstanding the individual, given that right. there's already been so much tarnishing of his image. And so people say Charles Darwin was an atheist, he was a nihilist, 
He was a, a you know, a, a Zionist. I've even read some works where where they where one individual said that Charles Darwin was a was a hidden Zionist, and he developed the theory of evolution so that it could cripple religion and you know all, all kinds of things that fed into the Israel Palestine conflict. Right? He was a racist. He was a Marxist. He was an imperialist. Now. Wow. There's no doubt that Charles Darwin was a man of his times in the sense that he did have Victorian sensitivities, but most of these, if not all, are incorrect. And that's the corrective that I'm trying to provide today. Most of the ideas, at least in the English literature, we can talk about the Arabic literature later on, and, and there's, there's tons that are written on Charles Darwin in Arabic, uh, but in the English literature, a lot of these isms kicked up through, I believe, one important source. And that is Harun Yahya, Adnan Akhtar, right? In the early 1990s, all the way to the 2000s, he shot to fame. He wrote several books. You can see some of the, the titles here, Darwinist Propaganda Techniques, Darwinism Refuted. And in there, he says that Charles Darwin was a pagan. He was an atheist and all sorts of things. And this really formulated and impressioned a lot of Muslims in how they view Charles Darwin, right? And what I want to do is kind of divorce the, the theory from the man and just look at the man himself. Right. This is a, an overview of his life. We start in 1809, which is when he was born, all the way to his death in 1882. In between, we have a few key events, right? Such as him going to university, you know, him getting married, him having kids, him starting losing faith and all of that. Now... This is a very messy timeline for our purposes. And all I want to show is this. Uh, and this division of Charles Darwin's life uh, is articulated by Nick Spencer, who, whose book I'll, sh I'll share at the end of this presentation. It is one of the most interesting and careful biographies of Charles Darwin. So all of Char Charles Darwin's uh, personal notebooks were collected, they were put into an archive, and they were made public so that there was easier uh, capabilities to search through those materials. And he eventually penned that book down in 2006. And he believes that you can roughly divide Charles Darwin's life into three phases. So in the early phase, he was a Christian of sorts. And then between 1836 to 1851, we see developments of him losing faith. And then finally him moving on to an agnostic phase. Right. It's interesting. And, just interrupt. I mean, this he lived during the Victorian era in in England, uh, yeah. obviously. And uh, I mean, w without getting too much off the subject, this kind of timeline, this trajectory, Christian, diminishing faith, agnostic, strikes yeah. me as as very typical of literally millions of Victorian English men and women during the nineteenth century. Actually, mm -hmm. it, it it doesn't seem to be like an isolated, eccentric kind of Darwin Darwin's yeah. own story or there is his personal journey yeah. but we can look at people like uh, george Eliot, the famous novelist who started as a christian yeah. and uh she ended up an atheist actually but many many um educated people at that time felt their christian uh faith under attack because of, of discoveries of biblical manuscripts and contradictions of the bible uh, archaeology history and darwin as well so um he, he is part of a a, a culture and a, uh, which is changing and undergoing great uh, stress as a result of perceived challenges to Christian faith in the 19th century. So I just want to situate this in a, a larger Victorian context. I don't think this is just a one man story. It really strikes me as typical of many, many uh, English men and women in Britain. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Uh, of course, I don't think I can, that can be generalized to every single person, but definitely a representation of the it, intelligentsia. I think that does have a... Um, uh, As a um, one caveat, yes. So you, yeah. you are absolutely right. It's intelligentsia, ed, ed, very educated people. You're right, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I wanted to make sure that people don't see these as like, you know, hard boundaries. When we're talking about a person's life, I mean, it's it's... People are changing all the time, right? And it's very hard to say when he started thinking, when did he start leaving faith? So these should be treated as fuzzy lines and more as like heuristic markers, as markers for when things started changing a little bit. We can never cut up a person into discrete uh, boxes. And this is just, you know, a way of us representing three, you know, very clearly demarcated phases. But when yeah. exactly the start and end can be, you know, debated. Yep. With that made clear, we now start with the Christian phase. 
So um, in 1809, Charles Darwin was born into the Darwin family. And I don't want to get too caught up in his you know, younger years because that is uh, not, a, not, not of interest, at least for us. But he was born to a Christian context, right? Um, what's interesting is that when he started studying in his later years, he uh, went to the University of Edinburgh to do medicine. Unfortunately, I think after a couple of years, I think in two years, he didn't enjoy it and he left the university. Right? Well, it's, very, it's very cold up there anyway. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a very interesting period at the time in Edinburgh. There's a really good book um, that I forgot the name. It escapes me now, and it talks about how pivotal Edinburgh was because there was a very interesting dynamic going on at Edinburgh that wasn't really prevalent in. Cambridge. So even though Cambridge was the epicenter of the intelligentsia, they were very uniform. You had to be a particular type of Christian. You had to hold specific doctrines. Whereas yes. Edinburgh was a little bit more international. So you had people yeah. coming in from Europe and all kinds of debates took place. And I, I, the, the name escapes me, but I remember that Edinburgh was a very interesting institute at that time. Now, what's interesting, after he left um, Edinburgh, and people don't know this, he actually um, embarked on uh, a priesthood at the University of Cambridge in That's 18... right. so it's the Church of England priesthood, presumably, not the Catholic Church, or do we know which church? No, I, I, I can't say for sure, but I know he, he commenced the program at the University of Cambridge, and that might be the clue for anyone who wants to resolve it's probably, it. probably Church of England then at that time, yeah. Probably, yeah. probably. I, I, would, I would bet on that, but I can't be too sure. So, and, and that's surprising. I mean, that's somebody in, in, in our context with, is somebody who's training up to be an imam, right? Yeah. So I, I think that's interesting. And it is here where he stumbles upon people like William Paley, who we, who, you know, who we recognize today for the Paley's watchmaker argument, right? Right. And so this is a paragraph from Nick Spencer, the person who um, I was really um, intrigued by of the way he wrote and spoke about uh, Charles Darwin. So he says here, Darwin's pre-Beagle Christianity. So pre-Beagle is uh, the time before he went on his Beagle voyage. So just to put this on the timeline, 18... So the Beagle, the Beagle's the name of this ship, wasn't it? It's not like yeah. an animal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was on a voyage from 1831 to 1836. And I'll show you a nice map of all the places that he went. But uh, in his pre-Beagle voyage, before he embarked on this you know, long journey across the world, it says you that his Christianity was a synthesis of Paleon summer. We don't need to worry about who summer is. But he describes this as a dogmatic, ordered, disciplined, reasonable, civilized, benign, right? It had limited time for revelation and virtually none for personal experience. Christ was not so much a person to be transformed by as a theorem to be proved. God was, God was less the ground of our being, to which the sense of the sublime served as testimony, as he was the conclusion of a logical argument, right? So what he's, what he's trying to show is that he was very shaped by William Paley's ideas, that we have very clear sophistication in nature, and it, 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 we should really think that, you know, this was crafted by some kind of artisan. But it feels like um, Paley and, you know, rubbing off of Darwin, he didn't actually necessarily believe in a personal God of sorts. It was more of this, you know, abstract kind of God who created sophistication, but didn't really have that attachment with revelation, so to speak, right? So we get to see kind of a shade of Christianity that Charles Darwin entertained. And more can be said here, but this, I think, gives you some kind of that context of what Charles Darwin yeah. was engaging with. There's a funny remark in Charles Darwin's notes, uh, and he says this, considering how fierce, so this is, he wrote this after getting his work published, but I just wanted to share this remark. Considering how fiercely I've been attacked by the Orthodox, it seems ludicrous that I once intended to be a clergyman. So he even actually reflects on this era, you know, that I, I wanted to, to actually, you know, do this very seriously. I was very interested in, in religion. I was very interested in theology and how, you know, life directed him in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, he completed his, his, his bachelor's there and it, I think his MSc as well. And then in 1831, <clears throat> he then started his journey on the Beagle Voyage. And this uh -huh. is his entire um, span uh, of all the places that he's gone. So number one, he starts in a place called Plymouth. And he goes all the way down to South America, all the way around here. And then the famous Galapagos Islands is, can you tell me where it is? Which number, Paul? Let's see how good your geography is. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I can tell you where Plymouth is. I'm not sure about the Galapagos Islands. Okay, so it's going to be South America somewhere, yeah? 
You're right. It's in America somewhere, South America. So South which America. of the numbers? Uh, you want to give you a number. Okay, let's um, put my life in my hands. I'm going to go to number <laughs> four. Number four, but I could be wrong. Okay, so you're close, but uh, the opposite side. It's number 10. <laughs> Uh, that's not close at all. <laughs> well, I was going to use, you know, the benefit of the doubt. But it's on the same it's planet different. anyway. I've got that map. Yeah, right. yeah, same planet. So he goes all the way here around the world, through Australia, down Indian Ocean, through the bottom of Africa, and then back up again, all the way to. And so this was a very interesting time for him because Charles Darwin got to experience various cultures. So he saw, you know, non Eurocentric civilizations, he experienced earthquakes. And he saw, you know, so much biodiversity. And this is where we, where we have um, some um, uh, evidence to suggest that he started thinking about, you know, where all this was coming across. Galapagos Islands, the finches, was actually, you know, from this territory here. Ten. And so this is a map to show that he was a, you know, a well-traveled man. He did, sp you know, spend a lot of time um, outside of England, you know, studying the world, studying the different kinds of things that there are. So... Once he finished this journey, he came back and he started working. And bear in mind, Charles Darwin was, you know, from a, a, partic a particular class of the society. He was well off. Um, and, you know, he, he had, I think, several endowments. And so he didn't have to work nine to five, so to speak. As an English uh, gentleman who had, you know, leisure and freedom to do what he really wanted to do. He didn't have to go and work in an office or a factory or anything like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he was, you know, generally uh, well off. So so he had spent a lot of time, you know, um, looking and, and studying stuff, even in his own house. Like he had experiments around his house, um, which is which is very interesting. Uh, and so in 1836, this is where we stumble upon his diminishing faith phase. Now, before we talk about how he diminished, uh, how his faith started, you know, dwindling, I wanted to share a very funny thing that we get from his notebooks. So 1836, he comes down. Naturally, he's in his, I think, in, a, in his late 20s, right? And he's thinking about marriage as most, you know, Muslims get pushed to think about <laughs> towards their late 20s, right, early 30s. And he actually notes down the pros and cons of getting married. Really? <laughs> and wow. so, look, so, so, so th th these are not systematic thoughts. So we have like plus points and negative points on the left column for marriage and on the right column for not marrying, right? And so I just wanted to share some things with you. So if you look at that, um, constant companion who feel beloved and better, better than a dog, anyhow. That's uh, not a very high estimation of marriage. Yeah. So um, yeah. So he he, um, he he definitely thought it was better than having a dog. And then he, he he puts other thoughts as well. So imagine living all one's day solitarily in a smoky, dirty London house. Only picture to yourself a nice, soft wife on a sofa with good fire and books and music, perhaps. You know, so he's this is a human side of him. Like he, you know, he's thinking about these things just like you know the average Joe here and there, right? And then what are the the pros and cons of of not um, marrying? Well. He, he says this, loss of time, cannot read in the evenings. <laughs> so uh, just saying from my experience, right, my wife knows that I have to read a lot and I resonate a lot with Charles Darwin on this issue, you know. Like, uh, should I spend my well, time I mean, with my wife? Just to be, to be very modern here for a second, um, you know, the one thing is not mentioned in the marry, not married question at any point is sex in the absence of sex. It's, it, it's yeah. sex. <laughs> Uh, intimacy does not exist for the Victorian man. It's simply not a factor in not marrying yeah. or marrying. It's all to do with, you know, um, you know, having a nice soft wife on a sofa with a good fire at books and music, you know, <laughs> like you would, you know, there's no, nothing to do with intimacy at all. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, I just, I just thought I should share that because, and, 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 and interestingly in his notebook, um, this is what he says on top of the notebook on the page. It says, this is the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I found this really oh, funny. This is a new discipline, Darwinian marriage advice, isn't it? Yeah, it's Darwin, <laughs> science. There's now Darwinian marriage counselling and advice about whether or not you should marry or not. It's a new, a new scholarly branch of academia here. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. But yeah, I just I just thought that you know this gives you Very some fun. insight in that you know he was he was he was a human yeah. being and he had his he had his you know his thoughts and his moments. Now let's look into the the various kinds of things that he started thinking about that led to um, the diminishment of his faith. 
So the first thing was, we, we already saw from before that in the Paleonesque Christianity that was brewing at the time, right? Um, it was less, I would say, revelation-centric and more reason-centric. And so naturally, um, Darwin had issues with the Bible. So here he comes to say, by this time I had come to doubt the Old Testament with its manifestly false history of the world, with the Tower of Babel, um, the rainbow as a sign, etc. The problem is similar, if less acute, for the New Testament as the Gospels cannot be proved to have been written simultaneously with the events. And they differ in many important details, far too important to be admitted as the usual inaccuracies of eyewitnesses. Wow, that's incredibly insightful because that, that is the case. And the, the, these observations have been well known to biblical scholars for a number of generations now. And they, they do trouble, they cause doubt, actually, uh, in yeah. people's minds. They, they did to me when I encountered this at uni as well. So, yeah, yeah. The, this is this is very um, this is insightful and, and, ver and a very common Victorian and later reaction to the realities of the, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. So what, 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 what interests me is that, you know, he was taking his, his, his religion seriously. He wasn't just, you know, like putting it to the side. He was mm. actually thinking about these yeah. things. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting to, to hear. He then also had uh, moral objections against scripture. So here he says, scripture was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus. That's how they used to write Hindus in, th in those times or the beliefs of any barbarian. The plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. Right? This is very interesting because uh, there was a famous case, uh, F.D. Morris, uh, here in London, uh, who became a professor at King's College in London. And he actually denied the eternity of hellfire. And this mm -hmm. was in, I forget the exact time, but it was roughly around this time. And this caused a huge scandal in the church because the Ang uh, King's College is, is connected with the Church of England. And, but this was a, a very public uh, row argument in, in Christianity in Victorian England about, you know, uh, about relatives who died, who, who, who weren't Christian, uh, everlasting hell, God punishing people forever and ever. This was, this was, went out of fashion, went out of favor amongst many educated people. It's interesting, he says, and you're in your red red quote, not just his father and brother, but almost all his best friends um, would have been in hellfire. Uh, presumably they weren't believers. So there's a lot of unbelief around, a lot of unbelief. His family and friends are all unbelievers, or most of them anyway. Yeah. Oh, oh, you actually remind me, uh, Paul, and perhaps we can do a summary of that book. Um, I bought a book, I think, from the, from the 1950s, no, the 1930s. It's actually a book about atheists and agnostics in the Victorian era. It cost me an arm and a leg to get, but it might be good to review that. You reminded me. That that, that might be an interesting uh, thing to look into. Yeah, remind me. Okay, I'll, I'll, when I go back to Dubai, that's the first thing I'll do. Read that it's book. Just, it's, it's so many of his friends and family were not believers. So yeah. he, he, again, this is not just Darwin. He's part of a wider social uh, familial context of unbelief. Yeah, so just it, it may be better to qualify not necessarily unbelievers, but perhaps not orthodox believers, because you do get you know shades here. It may be that, yeah, right. So we have these moral objections against Christianity coming up in his thoughts. He also had philosophical issues. So here he says the clearest evidence would be requisite to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported. The more we know of the fixed laws of nature the more incredible do miracles become. Men at the time were ignorant, ignorant and credulous to degree, almost incomprehensible by us. So here is where we begin to see that you can yeah. see he, he's, he's not espousing traditional ideas, classical ideas of Christianity in the sense that God created the world and he could localize particular instances that breach or violate laws of nature, so to speak, using you know very crude language here. And he had an issue with that because he believed, you know, People make up stuff all the time. People of the past were very ignorant. And so we now know much better than them. And this was, I think, uh, really a thing about that era, about the Victorian era. Yes. Even, yeah. even in the Muslim world, you see artifacts like this kicking up in that 1850s to the 1920s era, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the quote-unquote reformers, like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, for example, he completely overread miracles with, with scientific stuff. So it seems to, it seems to be something there. Right, that 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 occupied the intelligentsia. Yeah. And finally, and this is, ah. I think, the, the 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 main thing. I think this is the crucible in it, in his shift. He had a huge problem with the problem of evil and suffering. Right. 
And so, and, I, and, I've, and I've put two sub points here. One was the evil and suffering he you know, thought of given evolution as the true account of the world. If evolution is true, it seems to be a very, a very cruel and inefficient process. So this is what he says. Mm. What war between insect and insect, between insects, snails, and other animals with birds and beasts of prey, all striving to increase and all feeding on each other or on the trees of their seeds and seedlings, or on the other plants which first clothe the ground and thus check the growth of the trees. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blunderingly low, and hardly cru cruel works of nature. Mm. A right. devil's chaplain, of course, I think is, is the name of a book. It's not by, by Dawkins, not Darwin. Yeah, it's, yeah, it. yeah, he, he, yeah. So there's a lot uh, of books named after, you know, uh, Darwin's um, slogans here and there, like the one long argument. Mm -hmm. Ernst Mayer wrote a book called One Long Argument, right? Um, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, about, part of the issue for Christians particularly is is the, the constantly iterated claim that God is love. God, God is, is love. God is all good. Yeah. Not yeah. That, it's not that God is loving, which is what yeah, the Quran yeah. says in several places, but God is love. He, he is a loving father or like, like a grandfather figure. And all the other attributes and names of God, there are many, many in Islam, in the Quran, um, are, are, are just simply not there. And yeah. so when you believe that God is love in this Christian definition, and then you counter, talk about human suffering here, let alone anything else, uh, you counter suffering and death in the world, it's very hard to see how these two beliefs, experiences, statements can be reconciled. But Islam, there are many, many names and attributes of God, and you have a much rounder, a much richer understanding of God's character or his attributes and the world now that problem of suffering doesn't actually arise historically in the islamic tradition um but it is a problem for christians who just believe god is love you know in that kind of absolute sense how do you reconcile that with evil and suffering it's very hard to see how you can do it yeah and i think it comes down to uh, some of the uh, christian axioms and it really plays a big role in evolution right so mm -hmm. in christianity um, it was believed that God created the world with goodness because God, you know, is, is loving. He's, he's love as well, right? And so he right. created the world with goodness. But when Adam ate from the tree, he fell from grace and evil and suffering entered the world. And yeah. this is a way of dodging evil from God to his creation, Adam in this yeah. case. Adam is yeah. the one responsible for evil and suffering coming into the world. But now, if you think about evolution, if there were entities before human beings, well, all of that cruel suffering and, and processes, who's responsible for that? And so I think this plays out in his thinking. And, and, and you can very clearly see it here. And this is why it's still an issue today. In Christian theology, in Christian circles and Christian materials, you do see this as, as a problem. Not necessarily that you know, there's no solution. Some people have very interesting proposals to them. But um, this is a problem that resonates with Christian theologians and thinkers till today. I, I agree, but the, uh, the point I want to stress is it's not just a problem with, uh, you know, an evolutionary problem with evil for yeah. Christians. The whole problem of evil as such for, yeah. has always been there in Christianity for, for many, many, many centuries because yeah. of this this emphasis on God is love. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that itself, because then, you know, a child who sadly suffers or dies, a mother dies and so yeah. how, how do you reconcile this? So it's not even a Darwinian issue. It's a general problem of theodicy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So just to link it um, uh, to, to that point and also um, evolution. So generally, when we talk about the problem of evil, we have moral evil and natural evil, right? So natural evil are like natural disasters like an earthquake a volcano killing people moral evil are what humans do to violate other people's rights like killing them stealing money from them right yuji yep. nagasawa he's a very well-known philosopher um, at the university of birmingham who's now moving to oklahoma um, he defines a new category of evil he calls it the syst syst systemic problem of evil because here we it's not just a local event or one person committing evil there's an entire process in the structure of life. And so this amplifies the problem of evil. Now, and, and, that, and that's what blew this up even more. But I agree right. with you that the problem of evil is a problem regardless, evolution or not, it is a yeah. problem for Christian thinkers. And yeah. the, the next part is this part. And this part, I really you know, resonated with a lot. Yeah. Now, so for me, um, uh, I, you know, I became a dad about, um, six, seven years, yeah, six years ago. And um, my thinking of the world before I became a father and after did shift, right? Um, and this is something that I wanted to share. When you become a parent, 
uh, you love your spouse a lot, but there's something about kids that just completely takes over. Like, and my wife feels it and I feel it. And for both of us, our number one priority is our son. My son's right. name is Joe, right? He's our number one priority. Now, the thought of me losing him is very painful. Now, of course, I accept it. If, if that's God's decree, that's God's decree. I can't do anything about it. And I accept God's decree. But there's, there's an aspect here that really touched me about Darwin. So Darwin had, um, if I'm not mistaken, a total of eight kids but only, or nine kids, but only six survived. One of the kids that he lost was a girl called Anna or Annie. And this was his favorite child. He makes it very explicit in his notes. And for the last two weeks of her life, you know, she kept coughing. She kept getting better, coughing. And he was with her. She was, he was, his wife was not with his daughter because she was pregnant with another child. So he took her to um, a, a medical place. I forgot exactly where. And he was with her day and night, day and night. And he talks about how this cute little child, this 10-year-old girl, would sometimes wake up feeling very healthy, but then she'd be throwing up again. And he would be in pangs. And this is what he writes after she passed away. Our poor dear child went to her final sleep most tranquilly, most sweetly. He wrote to Emma later in that day. This is Nick Spencer. She expired without a sigh. The memory of her was almost too painful to recall. How desolate it makes one to think of her frank, cordial manners. I cannot remember ever seeing the dear child naughty. And look what he says. God bless her. You know, I'm, and I resonate with that. I, I'm more so after becoming a father. And so he, he really did try to, you know, tackle these issues. Now, for me, he was very impressioned by, you know, a particular version of Christianity, a very paleon Christianity. What I take away from this is, you know, one, I understand what he was going through. But two, perhaps if he was in a different or maybe exposed to a different theological system, would he have, you know, left faith? Like, was, was this was this a uh, very sad death of Annie? Was this did he does he say that this was a factor in his diminishing faith? Or, yeah, or yeah, it, it's, 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 yeah, yeah. This is this is quite clear. Yeah, that this was a big moment in his life. Big moment. Yeah. Big big moment. Yeah, it's very sad. I mean, it's very sad that obviously she died that way, but also that he didn't have a different understanding of her life and her death and that she, she would have gone straight to paradise. She didn't, you know, she was tranquil at the end, most sweet, you know, I think for her, it would have been a very different experience as she transitioned from this life to the next into, into paradise uh, as all children are, of course, yeah. uh, in, in our understanding. But for him, it was, it was just, it was just desolation. Um, yeah. And so he didn't perhaps see that she actually wasn't desolated, the child, and she was actually going to a much better place, yeah. uh, it, to a, a place without suffering. So, yeah, anyway. Yeah. And so you see, look, look where Nick Spencer puts his agnostic face starting. 1851, the year she died. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. And so we now come to the, the last phase, um, according to Spencer's analysis. I mentioned Spencer's analysis because it, th these are his ideas, but I agree with his ideas based on my other wider reading. Um, and so let's now look into his agnostic phase. What we see here is in 1858, uh, so Charles Darwin had his ideas. We know that from 1836 to 1858, uh, um, he definitely you know, was sure about his evolutionary ideas, but he didn't want to pen it down. And that's because Charles Darwin, one, wanted to avoid controversy. He was a very cautious individual. He didn't want to upset people. He, didn't, he definitely didn't want to upset religious people. He was not the kind of person who stokes you know, religious folks. He wanted to be, you know, a low profile guy if he, if he could. What prompted him to write his book, Origin of Species, was the chap on the right hand side, Alfred Wallace. Right. Alfred Wallace was another, you know, naturalist who was living in Indonesia, Malaysia. But believe it or not, there's a street named after Wallace in Indonesia. Yeah. Because he spent a lot of time there. And so he came up with the idea of natural selection as well. He sent a proto -man manuscript to Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was alarmed. So they co-published this with the Linnaeus Society as you know, a draft piece. But then Charles Darwin rushed in 1859. Look, this is 1858. In 1859 is when the origin of species came out. That's what prompted him because he wanted to make sure that his ideas were fully you know, in support. He was you know, at least given credit for, for thinking of these things. 1859, this book comes out and this sparks you know, an interesting reception. And it wasn't like all good or all bad. It was mixed, as is expected in history. Yeah. Things are never yeah. always clear and cut, right? Yeah. And so um, 
What was interesting about Charles Darwin is that when he published this in his first edition, he writes a few things that make you wonder exactly where he was faith-wise. This is one of them. He writes this towards the end, if I'm not mistaken. To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on the matter by the creator. See, so he's not really kind of, it's, it's unsure exactly where he stands here. That the production and extinction of the past and present inhabitants of the world should have be, been due to secondary causes, like those determining the birth and death of the individual. Right? So he was a cautious man. He was a cautious man. Now, there were some good receptions. There were some bad receptions. I'm just going to give you one example of each. This is Reverend yeah. Tristan. This is what he says. Knowing that God ordinarily works by natural means, it might be the presumption of an unnecessary miracle to assume a distinct and separate origin for many of those which we term species. Every mm -hmm. peculiarity of difference in the living inhabitants of each country is admirably adapted by the wisdom of their beneficent creator for the support and preservation of the species. So this is a person who has no problem kind of embracing evolution. He didn't see it as that much of an issue. On the other hand, Professor Sedwick, who was once his teacher, this is what well, he was once Charles Darwin's teacher. He thought this was a this was a bogus theory. This was a disgusting theory. Why? Here's what he has to say: There's a moral or metaphysical part of nature as well as physical. A man who denies us deep in the mire of folly, were it possible to break humanity in my mind, would suffer damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell us of its history. So you can see he didn't like it. He d definitely did not like it. He, he, he thought the whole idea of there being continuity between human beings and everything else is just, no, that's not going to be entertained. I mean, this is quite, quite, quite pathetic in the sense of what happened in the 20th century with the rise in, you know, of, of fascism and Nazi Germany and Stalinism in Russia. Um, the, the, you know, he, he says there's a moral and metaphysical part of nature as well as a physical. And he, who denies this, like, say, communism, Marxism does, is deep in the mire of folly. Uh, and and you know uh, um, uh, um, we're talking about damage that might brutalize it, and you know you can see it's almost pathetic because that did come to pass in the yeah. anti-theistic materialist Dar pro-Darwinian narrative you see um, in, in national socialism and communism. I think. Yeah, social Darwinism really kicked up. But that was that wasn't a product of Darwinism. That was people taking Darwin's ideas and applying into social politics. That wasn't Darwin's yes. move. Though. Darwin never Fair did that. Enough. Fair enough. Right. So then we come to discussion about evolution or design, right? So again here, this is so he was impressioned by William Paley to think of in a very design-like fa fashion. But then comes evolution. He has now a theory which seems to explain design. So mm. is it design or not? And here we have an interesting disagreement between Charles Darwin and Asa Gray. Now for me, Asa Gray is a very interesting thinker. I really like him. Asa Gray was a botanist, an American botanist in the States. And he's the one who actually promoted Darwin's ideas in the US. These right. two individuals disagreed about whether evolution entailed or negated design. And I wanted to share this you know, difference with you. Asa Gray says the following. The Darwinian theory implies that the birth and development of a species are as natural as those of an individual, are facts of the same kind in a higher order. The alleged proof of the absence of design from it amounts to a simple reiteration of the statement with particulars. It appears to us that all this is begging the question against design in nature, instead of proving that it may be dispensed with. So he feels, as I just felt, previously we thought a particular item was directly crafted by God. Okay, but now we have a whole process that doesn't eliminate design, right? Who says eliminated design? And I think a modern contemporary um, who kind of, I, what I, I call him Asa Gray 2.0 is my friend Erky Rope Vesa Kajonan. He wrote a book on evolution or design with Palgrave, just came out, I think, last year. It's right. an excellent book. And he, he argues for exactly this that evolution is not, are not necessarily incompatible. It's a false synthesis. It's a false either or, which I know there's atheists make a big yeah. deal out of as well. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if you have a process, a process is a law that can be mapped out. And if you've identified laws as you know, being the indications of a lawgiver, so what? Now, Charles Darwin, given I, uh, that I mentioned earlier, he had a huge, huge problem, the problem of evil. This was his response. 
With respect to the theological view of the question, this can always be painful to me. This is always painful to me, sorry. I am bewildered. I had no in intention to write atheistically. So he's responding to people who thought that, you know, his ideas led to atheism. I cannot see as plainly as others do, and as I wish to do, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to be too much misery in the world. So it's, it's the problem of evil that's, Pulling him back a little bit. He, but he, look, look what he says. As I should, I, I should wish to do. Mm -hmm. right. Very interesting. I, I really enjoyed this, this, this interesting and respectful engagement that he had. He mm -hmm. also had now problems with, you know, God's existence given evolution. So these are some quotes that I, I, I was able to identify. Right. So they're not connected. These are just in different parts, right? So the first quote he says, but then with me, the hard doubt also arises where the conviction of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so he didn't have the concept of a traditional soul. That's what I was able to gather from, from his ideas. Right. 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 The second paragraph is really interesting. The strongest argument for the existence of God is the instinct or intuition, which we all, as I suppose, feel that there must have been an intelligent beginner of the universe. Look at this. He says it's, it's instinctive, right? Almost close to a plantica called sensus divinatus, right? But then oh. comes the doubt and difficulty whether such intuitions are trustworthy. Right? So, again, a guy who's, who's really trying to think. And, 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 and I appreciate at least, even if I disagree with him, that he is trying to kind of make sense of all of these in light of the theory of evolution. Now, this is the real thing that I wanted to uh, get into. There has been a lot of misappropriation of Charles Darwin by both Muslim scholars, such as Adnan Oktar, Harun Yahya, who we looked at earlier, mm. but also modern day atheists. And right. they, the latter uh, and the former, both of them hijack Darwin for an atheistic representation that evolution entails atheism. But look what Charles Darwin himself says. These are, again, two different paragraphs. The safest conclusion seems to be that the whole subject of, you know, this, of man's intellect is beyond the scope of man's intellect. I am forced to leave the problem insoluble. I think generally, and more so as I grow older, but not, not always, that agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. He makes it explicit in his text. So there, there's a humility there, and unlike say people like Dawkins, who um, I don't mean to be uh, attack public figures publicly, yeah. but you know he has been accused of being quite arrogant and and, and uh, you know having a dogmatic uh, certainty about things which science doesn't warrant. But his own uh, you know hero Darwin uh, suggests a very different mentality of humility uh, yeah. and. and Doubts, yes, but not arrogance and attack and, and, and denunciation and ridicule yeah. of other people's beliefs. Yeah. Very As I said it. earlier, if you if you read his biography from various thinkers and also his own personal notes, he did not like to cause religious controversy. He, he mm -hmm. was just not that sort of person. He says in another place, I cannot pretend to throw light, uh, to the least light on such abstruse problems, i.e. You know, understanding God. The mystery of the beginning of all things is soluble by us, and I, for one, must content to remain agnostic. This brings me to the contemporary period, right? Aha, uh -huh. here we go. We have people like Richard Dawkins today who were adamant in thinking that evolution entails atheism. I personally think if Charles Darwin was alive today, I think he would question Charles Darwin. And that's why I made this caricature up because I feel that he really had, as you said, epistemic humility. I don't think he would have been as mm. arrogant, mm. as um, you know, um, aggressive as people like Richard Dawkins. I, I, I just love the this, this semantic scenario: uh, uh, Darwin and Dawkins, both English scientists, professors at Oxbridge. I mean, there, there's so many kind of extraordinary parallels. Although they obviously never met each other, but Dawkins and Darwin, even the names are similar. But uh, <laughs> but one, as you say, had epistemic humility, and the other had arrogant denunciation and attack on anyone who wasn't atheist. And that's not Darwin's position, as you have proven uh, through multiple quotes. Yeah. And I just wanted to leave on a, on a, on a more of a personal touch. Right. 
apparently this is the last photo of Darwin before he passed away in 1882. And I didn't know this until maybe recently. When I look at this photo, I don't see somebody who's triumph, you know, who, who, who's, who's gleeing over the success of his theory, right? I see somebody who's very troubled. That's what I get from this photo. I really feel that he was troubled and he was having difficulties in reconciling these ideas. And so the lessons I take, despite our disagreements, despite our different worldviews, despite our different placements in, in, in history, I believe that Charles Darwin was a humble man and a very patient man. If you read his writings very carefully, you will see that he shows amazing adab, I would say. So in his Origins of Species, right? If you, if you look at the last part of Origins of Species, he actually says, so this is what I say, but this is how you could disprove my theory, yeah. right? He knew the age of the earth was an issue. The best estimates of the day were between 20 to 100 million years old. Yeah. Uh, and this was largely because of Lord Kelvin, the best British physicist of the time. This was nowhere near enough to allow his theory to hold true. After his death, posthumously, we came ac across radioactivity and it pushed the age of the earth back to 4.6 billion years old, right? Yeah, yeah. He talks about, you know, other things that you could build a fossil record. He talks about, you know, various ways in which you can disprove it. Now, as you yourself highlighted, scientists can get very arrogant, but that's not the style that you see in, in Darwin's works. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to leave people with a, some amazing works that I think have been done on Charles Darwin and yeah. his ideas in the contemporary context. So Nick Spencer is, is, is the work that I've been quoting from quite a lot, Darwin and God. And that's the book on the left-hand side. On the fourth book from the left is The Reluctant Mr. Darwin by David Quammen. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but these two are excellent biographies. Mm -hmm. On the second uh, left, you have a book on Asa Gray. These, this is a collective volume of all his work, and you can read about design here. And this is the work on design that I was, I was speaking about uh, my friend, uh, Erki Vesa, Rob Kajonan. He's a Finnish scholar. It's an excellent book. I really recommend it. Now, the best book in this, well, not the best, but one of the most important works is the one on the right by Professor Fern uh, Elson Baker. She's a lovely scholar. She's in the University of Birmingham. She wrote this book, and look what he, what's the subtitle? Uh, How Richard yeah. Dawkins rewrote Darwin's legacy. And I, I like the, the picture, the, the, the face there is Darwin himself, uh, Dawkins, I should say, uh, yeah. recognizably, I think, um, you know, shouting through a megaphone. You get the sense of a raucous political yeah. slogan, shouting. Yeah. Um, and yet the book itself is, is a sober uh, evaluation, of course, how he wrote, yeah. presumably changed uh, Darwin's legacy. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, she mentioned to me that when she wrote this book, she got a lot of uh, a lot of death threats. That's why she removed herself from social media. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's what she said. To me. So it's, it's amazing that, you know, when 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 when, she, when you're trying to present an academic piece that even the aggressiveness comes even across on social media platforms. But no, this I, book I, I, is a, yeah, I like I like to get that book out the the selfish uh, ge the selfish genius uh, the pun on the selfish gene a book by yeah. Dawkins of course um, yeah. that looks amazing. So the the, the middle one uh, the compatibility of evolution and design who is the author of that book? It's uh, Erki Vessa Rob Kajonan. He's a Finnish scholar, and right. uh, him and I we were working together on actually um, the world's first I think Abrahamic volume on design. So we mm -hmm. have design arguments from the Islamic, Jewish, and Christian traditions, and we had a conference at. Um, I think it was University of Helsinki, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, so that's coming out hopefully next year. And so we have a lot of- What's, what's his academic background? So he's a, he's a theologian and a philosopher. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. And so these, these are all excellent works that I recommend. This book is by the way neutral. It doesn't argue from a theological angle. It's purely philosophical. It's purely philosophical. So it's, it, 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 it can work <laughs> into an Islamic context, a Jewish context, or even a, a, a Christian context. Yeah. To put it all together, I just wanted to highlight that there are many misconceptions about Charles Darwin, and it's it's good for us to kind of recognize that. Um, and and I, you can have whatever opinion you want about evolution. You can be a creationist. That's fine. But at least we should be careful with misaligning people, because just like how we are careful with making sure that we don't say anything bad about, you know, the prophet, the sahaba, or anything like that, we should be equally careful about other people we speak. Because on the Day of Judgment, those things are going to come to us. And so when you have a person who has been you know, lied about, who's been termed all kinds of things, it's very important to make sure that we're, we're being accurate 
If not, it could come back to haunt us. That's what actually drove me to looking into his history. Mm-hmm. I find him to be a very humble man, a very respectful individual, and a very patient individual. And he generally struggled with faith. And yeah. I, if I were to take a lesson from his life, it would be exactly what you highlighted earlier, which is the concept of epistemic humility. He had challenges, he had certain theological inclinations and philosophical inclinations, and he had a particular you know, scientific idea ahead of him. And he definitely had no way of how to, he didn't know how to kind of put it all together. And this is somebody you know, who shows me epistemic humility. I'm not saying, I'm, and nor am I arguing that this means you should now be agnostic. That's not my argument at all. No. I'm just saying we should be cautious and we should also find good where we find it. And the goodness that I found in Charles Darwin was, was that he was a careful thinker and scholar. God knows best. Gosh, that's very interesting. Fascinating uh, survey. Oh, sorry, I, I took you off there. Um, no, no. These are your social media platforms, uh, your Twitter, um, uh, your uh, um, academia page, Facebook. Um, at the top one, what's that one? I'm not familiar with. That's an email. <laughs> that's an outlook. The outlook oh, that's email. <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, I was, yeah, of course it is. Silly me, an email address. Uh, good, that's very brave of you to allow people to email you. Uh, because <laughs> they, well, they will. <laughs> and uh, on Twitter, uh, definitely worth following on Twitter. Your Academia page is definitely worth subscribing to. And of course, your Facebook page as well. So um, thank you uh, very much. And, and I will add to uh, the list of recommended books, your own uh, magnum opus so far, anyway. Uh, Islam and Evolution, Al-Ghazali and the Modern Evolutionary Paradigm. Um, I do I highly recommend this book, actually, that everyone should read it. Whether or not you agree with your conclusions is not the point. It's a very careful and a scholarly, balanced survey of the issues. So I do highly recommend this to everyone to read. A couple of other books, um, which uh, I know, uh, Sherb, you, you, you like as well. Um, Stephen Mayer's Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries that Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Now, this is not just about evolution. It's to physics, cosmology, uh, etc. So this is a much broader survey. But... Highly recommended by yourself, uh, I, I believe. And um, lastly, and not least, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of anim- uh, Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design by Stephen Mayer. I'll just read a few sentences from the, the prologue of the book. In The Origin of Species, so says Mayer, Darwin openly acknowledged important weaknesses in his theory and professed his own doubts about key aspects of it. Yet... Today's public defenders of a Darwin-only science curriculum apparently do not want these or any other scientific doubts about contemporary Darwinian theory reported to students. This book addresses uh, addresses Darwin's most significant doubt and how a seemingly isolated anomaly that Darwin acknowledged almost in passing has grown to become illustrative of a fundamental problem for all evolutionary biology. That's from the prologue of this book, Darwin's About by Stephen Mayer. Again, whether or not you agree with it is up to you. Uh, I'm not saying you should agree with it. I'm saying it's a very well written written book by a guy who understands the arguments and the evidence quite well, I think. So do you have Berlinski's book, Darwin's Delusion? I I do. I I forgot to, it's it's behind me somewhere. I forgot to dig it out. (laughs) Okay. No, yeah, uh, yeah. He, 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 Belinsky is uh, a, a fascinating, very entertaining, witty, and brilliant writer. Um, so, whether or not you agree with him, he's he's a great read. I think. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Good stuff. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Shoaib, for your your time. Absolutely fascinating. It's so important, uh, as you have done, to to highlight the human being, the man, Darwin, and his own disposition and epistemic humility towards the world around him, and to situate him very much in this Victorian context as a man who struggled with doubt, as many uh, of his contemporaries did at that time because of other scientific discoveries and problems with the Bible and the Gospels and so on. So he was very much a man of his time, actually, uh, in terms of his struggles. So we can't just necessarily think, well, we're like him. I think we, we live in a different world now. Uh, we know so much more about DNA, for example, and, and, uh, and well, not going into all of that. So, um, but nevertheless, very important to understand that he's not an atheist that he's been misappropriated or abused, if you like, intellectually by some of his so-called followers even today. So thank you Muslims very much. As well. Muslims, Muslims as well. I, yes. I think that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I think that, 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 that needs to be at least corrected from our side a little bit. We, we should no, look at it. Fair enough. This is fair enough. Okay. All right. Thank you very much uh, to you, Shoy. Thank you. Uh, thank you.